Hey, thank you guys so much for, for being here today. This end, um, if you guys didn't see the video on Easter, Kay and Jack have been praying for, for years for these guys. And um, amazing that you guys could make it to, to town this week. You guys okay if we interrupt? I mean, this was a little bit spontaneous. Was that okay that we had an interruption for... Man. I'm going to try to start the sermon without crying, but we're... Um, it's neat. And it's, it's a reminder to pray, to pray. So much of the time we try to uh, fix earthly problems, our spiritual problems with earthly solutions. And, and there's a family that's been praying for each other for over a decade. So it's a reminder just to keep praying, keep loving on people and stick with people as, as life goes on. Uh, but, but this week, uh, this week we're remembering not just new life here at Grace Church, but new life all around the world. This is Mission Sunday. If you walked in halfway through service you, and you were trying to figure out what was going on, it's Mission Sunday. That's what's going on. Twice a year we do this and uh, we always pick a theme to say how can we remember that at Grace Church we are not just one congregation here, but we're a part of a global family. We're a part of a people around the world that, that worships Jesus as God. And we want to remember that because we are supposed to be lights in the world, not just lights to each other. So today in particular, we're celebrating all the expressions of God's kingdom all around the world and how those are represented here at Grace Church. So even on, do you guys see the tables in the lobby? Yeah, there's going to be food in there pretty soon. I'm very excited about it. So, <laughs> um, But the point is we want to celebrate not just the nations out there, but how they're represented at Grace Church. And so today the sermon is titled, Pictures of Heaven. Pictures of Heaven. So let me pray. Father, thank you so much that you love all of us, that, that you look down on this world, that it says, for God so loved the world. And we thank you that you see us, each from our individual stories, all of our unique backgrounds, that we all make up a picture of your kingdom. We thank you for your heart that you want every single person on this planet to be saved, to be loved, and to be in a community where they are taken care of. And God, I pray that we have open hearts today to hear your words. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, I am Keith. I get to be the pastor here at Grace Church, so welcome. If you're watching from home, welcome. And I have had the privilege in my life of being able to be several places that I can only describe as little pictures of heaven. Uh, Malibu Rapids, British Columbia, where the Canadian Rockies just plummet down into the Pacific Ocean. As a teenager, I got to go to New York City, just in Times Square at rush hour. And as a scrawny white kid from a hick town standing in Manhattan, I mean, it was... It was overwhelming, but it was, it was exciting. It was wonderful to see the buildings, the parks, the different people, the different smells. And I was like, I, I like this. Uh, but, but one story I wanted to start with that I think is the best picture is the first time that I got to go to Hawaii. Who here, anybody here been to Hawaii? Hey, yeah, okay, give, give it up for Hawaii. Thank you, God, for making Hawaii. I love that spontaneous applause for an island. Uh, so... We, uh, I got to go for the first time for my honeymoon, so I'm like 23 years old and I'd never been before, so my wife and I are planning the wedding, planning the honeymoon, people ask the question, where are you going for your honeymoon? By the way, Brittany and Tyler, where are you guys at? Welcome home. Ah, uh, yeah, you guys love public attention, they just got back from their honeymoon. Hi guys, yeah, sorry, that was too much spontaneity today, we got to go to Taylor back. We got different languages and baptisms and the story, focus everybody, Okay. Uh, got to go to Hawaii, so we start telling people, all the aunts and uncles and grandmas and grampies, and we're like, where are you going? We're going to Hawaii. And we get this over and over again, oh, that's paradise. Where in Hawaii? We're going to the island of Kauai. Oh, the Garden Island? Oh, you're going to love it. And they would proceed to tell me what I'm going to love about my honeymoon, which was, you're going to love the flora and the fauna, the, the, the diverse landscapes, the biodiversity, it's, it's, you're going to just absolutely love it. And I'm, th I'm smiling like, you idiot. Like, <laughs> that's what I'm going to be thinking about on my honeymoon with my gorgeous new bride is plant life. That's exactly where. <laughs> so, but, but who's the idiot at the end of the story? It's me, right? We get on the plane. We land in Kapa'a. We rent the car. We drive around the south side of the island. And I'm like, there's little cactuses here. And there's a desert beach. And we drive around the corner. And there's savanna grasslands where they literally filmed Jurassic Park. It looks like another world. Then you come around the corner. And Mount Waialele, 
goes up like 5,000 feet, straight cliff, rains every single day there, like 400 inches, and there's palm trees. You go around the corner, and there is flowers bigger than your head. And I was just, walked just everywhere we went. was like, babe, the biodiversity, it's amazing. It's like, Warner, honeymoon, focus, Keith, me. All right, it's an exaggeration, but you get the story. The point being, some of the most amazing places that I've been it's in the diversity, it's in the richness of, of the different pieces of it that give this image of, of God. It, it shows the majesty of God and all his different facets that he shows up in the world. And, and they're fitting metaphors for heaven, for paradise. I mean, Hawaii is literally nicknamed paradise. And it's in this paradise that we see some of those diverse landscapes on the planet. So our verse today gives another picture of heaven, the one that is on the back of your handout. We're actually going to use this thing today. Sometimes I skip it, but we're going to work on this today. And Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, this is the Apostle John at the end of his life, and he was granted before he died a little picture of heaven and what it would be like. And, and it goes like this. John says, After this I looked... And there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. It's a sea of people. From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Every nation, every tribe, people, and language. It's a sea of the whole world coming together in heaven, all singing to the Lamb, to Jesus. And, and this word salvation is what they're celebrating. Salvation is what every heart longs for. Salvation, it, its literal word means that it's a deliverance from the harm or the ruin of this life. So, so if you've ever been somebody who has gone through this life, through this world, had pain in your family, pain in your body, th th there's a hope that we have in heaven that every single person around the world has an open invitation to come and be healed of everything from this world. That's what we mean by salvation is God saying, come, I want to make all things right. Even when this world went wrong, I want to fix it and bring you home to a place where there's no more tears, no more suffering. So, We've been in the book of Genesis this, this last year. We spent like two months on the first couple chapters. Genesis tells the story of how salvation came into the world. God made the world good, but the story goes that Adam and Eve sinned, and, and like a virus, it infected the human race. And so now people generally tried to live for themselves, were infected with, with selfishness, and the Christian word for that is sin. But, but God looks down on the world and he doesn't see a world that's, that's all messed up and just go, well, they blew it. He, he intervenes. He gets involved in the story. And, and the way he gets involved is, uh, it's fitting for humans. He says, I'm going to bless the world through a family. And through a man named Abram, who would later become Abraham, he says, I'm going to create a new family, a new people that are invited into this salvation, that, that are invited to all become a part of this family. And for thousands of years, this was just one family. It was, it was a genetic family. It was the Hebrew people. But part of our story is that Jesus Christ gave the invitation for everybody, every tribe, tongue, and nation to be invited, to be grafted in, as the Bible says, into the family of God. The verse that, that paints this picture beautifully, that sums it all up, is Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3 says this. This is Paul talking to a church that's at risk of being divided at risk of being divided by socioeconomic status, by religious background, by heritage. But it says, understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Now, sorry, some people might think this is a typo. They think it should say those who are genetically uh, connected to Abraham, those who are from Texas, those who vote correctly, those who, right, no. But those who have, what's the word? Faith. That is the one thing required for God, is to, to, to love God and to believe in him. That is the only thing that unlocks the door to God and to heaven and to being right. Those who have faith are children of Abraham. And scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. The Gentiles 
where everybody who wasn't Hebrew, it's, it's almost everybody in this room, it, it's saying that God wanted to make everybody in the world right with him, and he gives an offer, an open door to heaven, that he would justify the Gentiles by faith. And he announced the gospel in advance to Abraham, that all nations would be blessed through you, Abraham. It goes on, so it says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. And it keeps going. It says this, For all of you were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourself with Christ. What we celebrate in baptism is people becoming a part of the family. It's like an adoption or a wedding day. It's, it's families coming together. And, and we celebrate baptism because when Jesus went down into the tomb and then rose from the dead, that's what we celebrate in baptism is our old life is gone. We say, I don't want my old life. I want to lay it down. What, whatever that thing is, whatever the addiction or the conflict, that thing about myself that I hate, that thing that was done to me, we lay it down, we leave it in the grave, and we have a new life in Christ. And, and like a new pair of clothes, we put on Christ and we wear a new identity as children of God. The result of this is, is astounding. In a, in a church, in a Roman empire, in a Greek culture that was strictly divided, he says, but now there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. The cross of Jesus created a new spiritual family. A new spiritual family. So our theology as Christians, what we believe is that because God is our father, because God has adopted us, that means that we are all brothers and sisters. Can you look to your neighbor and say, hello brother or sister, depending, just... Now look at someone that you don't know. In honor of Mission Sunday, look across the room like 20 feet, catch eyes with somebody that you don't know, and say, hello, brother. <laughs> and then find them later in the lobby and give them a big awkward hug if you're a hugger, right? But we're, the point is that we're a new spiritual family, that if you come and sit in here, this isn't a social club, this isn't an activity that we truly believe that we are closer than blood because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. So when we talk about this new spiritual family, I wanted to take a few minutes to unpack this new spiritual family, what it is, what it isn't, and what it means for us. I'm going to do a couple minutes on each one. The middle one is super short, and then we're going to close out with some more singing um, and then we're going out to the lobby to enjoy food from many different nations. So the first one, what it is. What is this new spiritual family? So Jesus' new spiritual family is anchored in one thing. Any guesses, kids? It's anchored in Jesus, yeah. I put love. I love that Jesus answered. It's anchored in love. There's a series of Bible verses that I want to rattle through to just show how serious God is about loving one another. John 13, when Jesus is about to leave his disciples, he said, hey, I've got one more thing that I want to command you. Before I go, remember this. Never forget this one. He says, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. So a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So this is the family of God, the Christians, the, the people who practice the way. Those are people who love God and love their Christian brothers and sisters. That's, that is the essence of what it means to be in the family of God, is loving God and loving others. But you may ask, okay, so I'm in the family. What are the family expectations? What kind of rules do we have here? You grew up with some, anybody grew up with some weird parents with some weird rules? Raise your hand. Okay, thank you for your honesty. <laughs> How should we treat the neighbors? How should we treat people? That, way too many hands went up. The, <laughs> um, the family expectations. There, there's a series of verses throughout the Bible that, that God is very serious again about love. Luke chapter 6 is, is one of Jesus' famous teachings. I try to put here up all the time. We live in a divided world, so I'm like, no, Luke 6. Luke 6 says this. But you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. 
not, not just your literal neighbor next door, but even your enemies. This is a people oppressed by Rome. They'd be like, that guy? That guy crucified my uncle last week. Yeah, love that guy. It, it was a radical teaching that hit people in the face. Love your enemies. But Jesus' teachings, uh, the New Testament, weren't necessarily new. Most of what Jesus said, he's actually quoting the Old Testament. So one of the laws, one of the Old Testament laws that they had in Leviticus 19 went like this, that Jesus is referencing. Leviticus 19 says, When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself. For you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And I love how God just ends the law like that. Like, hey, here's the rule. Remember, I'm God. That's, that's good. This is a reminder to the Hebrew people saying, hey, as you come into the land, rem- remember back that you used to be foreigners. In, in essence, it's saying like, hey, if there's a new kid in class, be nice to them because remember, you were the new kid at one point. And I find it amazing how quickly we feel like locals. Anybody lived in Camas for five generations already? You could trace it back to the 1700s. Five, close. <laughs> the point being, most of us moved here in the past five, 10, 15, 20 years, and I'm amazed at how quickly we feel. I've, I've been here less than five years, and within a couple months of being here, I was like, darn people from California taking over our land. My boxes aren't even unpacked in my living room. Like, they're, they're taking up all the park space. There's got to be no green belts left. Right? I'm just like, okay. The hypocrisy there is pretty staggering, but we can feel like locals in an instant. But God says, hey, remember? Remember when you were foreigners? Remember when you were new? You need to treat people with kindness and remember that you were once foreigners in Egypt. One more verse before we move on. Acts 17 says this. The God who made... The world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. This verse goes on. I didn't put it up here. But it says that God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own prophets have said, we are his offspring. The point of all of this is that God wants a big family. God loves a big family and he wants everybody to be invited. And so the result of this, the way it flushes itself out in this world is as Dr. Tim Mackey said. You guys know the Bible Project guy, Dr. Tim Mackey? Everyone loves Hawaii. Woo, hey, Hawaii and Dr. Tim Mackey are two things that I've got. I hope Tim goes to Hawaii. We can be super happy for him. Okay. Tim, looking at world history, said this. The Jesus movement, not the 1960s Jesus movement, but like 0 AD Jesus movement when Jesus was here. The Jesus movement is the most culturally and ethically diverse people movement that has ever happened in the human race. Sometimes if we haven't traveled much or we've only been to resorts outside of America, if we get all of our information from cable news, we might think that Christianity is an American religion. It's like Ronald Reagan wrote the Bible, right? Like, so the, that wasn't a political thing. I, I love Ronald. Spaceships. It's great. Um, this, uh, but the message of new life in Christ, this message is a global phenomenon that has been happening for thousands of years. It, in, before it ever came to North America, it, it has exploded through South America, through Africa, through Asia. Hundreds of millions of people around the world have heard and followed Christ all around the world before it ever came to our shores. And so you look around the world and you see different pictures of this. The largest church in the world is in South Korea. Yoido Full Gospel Church They have half a million members. They used to have 700,000, but they've dipped a bit down to 500,000. Slightly larger than Grace Church. (laughs) Working on it. Um, I read an NPR article this week about the church exploding in Brazil. And the NPR article said this. 
Brazilians turn to an evangelical church in a rural town racked by drugs and poverty. This is the norm. These people have never heard of John Mark Comer. They don't care the first, you know, one thing about our conflicts between Democrats and Republicans. They, they read the Bible. They had Jesus preach to them. And around the world, this is exploding, that people are finding hope in Jesus Christ. So what is Christianity? Christianity is a global family where we believe that every individual has infinite value before God, the God who created the universe, and that his desire is through the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ to adopt anybody with faith into that family. That's what we believe Christianity is. But before we uh, get to the last point, I want to hit quickly on what it isn't, what Christianity is not. When I wrote my notes, I, I put down maybe 75 things that it's not I'm like, it's not this, and people have this wrong, but I picked one uh, just to take a minute or two that I thought would be important to share today. Christianity is not about losing your identity. It's not about assimilating into some pop culture out of some, I don't know, England, New York, L.A. It's not about losing who you are, losing your family heritage, losing what you are to, to come conform to one broad thing. Christianity highly values the individual and it highly values culture. That is how it has become such a diverse landscape around the world. It doesn't depend on a language. It doesn't depend on a singular family tradition or set of customs. Anybody in the world can share baptism and the communion table. Ephesians 2 says that we are God's masterpiece. He doesn't want to, to fix and change us and, and bleach us and make us all exactly the same. We are his masterpiece created to do good works. 1 Corinthians 12 says this about the body. <clears throat> It uses the human body as a metaphor to the diversity that we find in the church. It says the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. The verse goes on to explain how important it is for the eyes, the ears, the hands, and the feet to be different. Like it'd be weird to have a body full of eyes. That's like something out of a horror movie, right? We're supposed to be different. We're made that way so that we can serve and love each other with our different, unique cultures, individual personalities. <clears throat> so I, I would ask, just, just me personally, please do not lose your heritage your family values, your customs, your personalities, the things that make you unique as an individual and as a people group. I have a friend I talked to this week who said, if there's not ethnic food in heaven, I don't want to go. <laughs> That's kind of maybe a bit of an overstatement. However, I get your point. Um, the, everyone comes from a different place. I said, I'm a skinny white kid from a hick town, um, but I'm also English and Norwegian. And I'm okay being happy about that. I know those countries have done terrible things. The Vikings, not so great, right? But we gave the world soccer. You're welcome, right? <laughs> and poor dental care. Um, the, I'm English. I can say that. Don't judge my people. Um, the, uh, the gifts that the different cultures have given the world. I mean, where would the world be? The, the Germans, the Dutch, the Japanese, and the engineering marvels that they have given the world. French bread and Italian food. If you're Italian, please do not stop making Italian food, right? Uh, thank you. <laughs> Jake's half Italian, but he looks Norwegian. Um, the, I mean, what, what else is there? I, you know, I said I've been to Hawaii. We have some Hawaiian friends. The hospitality is incredible. I have some Hispanic friends, and the way that you guys do family, I mean, there's a gift to the world that we can all see and learn from. On the drive up here today, my, my playlist was going, and it came to Bill Withers, and I was like, oh my gosh, like, just, we need to keep Bill Withers in the world. Lovely day, ain't no sunshine, okay, nobody, everyone looked at me blank with Bill. Point is, don't lose your culture, don't lose your family heritage. There are beautiful gifts to the world that we can all be a part of. God's desire for us has become more like we are, not less. Just the way that in a healthy relationship, in a very healthy relationship, a healthy marriage, you find people like that saying, hey, I, I feel like more of who I was supposed to be 
not less. In the unity of this relationship, I find that I'm everything I was supposed to be because they draw it out of me. And so it is with Christ. Christ, it's this beautiful paradox of becoming more of who you're supposed to be while at the same time becoming a part of the whole body that loves you. The last one, what does all this have to do with us? This global, multicultural family that sings in different language, two billion people around the world, what does that mean for us here at Grace Church? And this is somewhere I want to get very practical because it affects us very much at Grace Church. And every day I feel a little bit more of how this global family affects us. And it starts with a little bit of history. And so if you're not excited about history, I would love to change your personal stance and be excited now about history. Can you please look to your neighbor and say, neighbor? Let's try again. Say, neighbor? Know your history. Okay, it shapes us so much. That we are. Um, America... Our nation itself is in a unique situation for for two main reasons. There's plenty more. But one, we have a messy history with the way that we populated this continent to the way that slavery came through. There is some really dark things that shaped what our world looks like today. We have a messy history. And we're also a nation of immigrants, of people who chose to come here. Other countries don't have to deal with this the way that we do. We have a richness and a complication in our country that other nations, nations like Egypt and Japan, their populations are over 100 million people, and they are close to 99% ethnically homogenous, which means that if you are from Egypt, you are Egyptian. That's basically the same thing. Our Finnish friends to the north, our blonde friends up there, Same thing. If you're from Finland, you're Finnish. America does not have that same continuity between ethnicity and I'm American. I've said I grew up with stories about Europe and World War II. Many of you, your grandparents, have come from any one of a different continent, and over the last two or three hundred years, we have all come here as a nation of immigrants through one way or another. It shaped us. And whatever you view about current immigration policy, the current crisis going on down at the border, you go back 200 years and there was a a policy put in place where we said we're going to be a country of immigrants from around the world. And in 1886, we put up a huge statue in the harbor of our biggest city. I had the chance to go to Ellis Island and I walked around and at the bottom of it, there's a poem. There's a little plaque there that's quite famous called The New Colossus. It was written by a poet named Emma Lazarus. I'm going to read it for us to remind us of what we have said in this country for hundreds of years. Whether we like it or not today, this is what fueled our country. The new Colossus, the poem, it was written in contrast to the old Colossus, the the largest statue in ancient world, a statue that said, keep out. The new Colossus essentially says, come in. So it begins by comparing the Statue of Liberty to the Greeks. It says, not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here, at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, her name is Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, send the homeless, the tempered toast to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. People who came through Ellis Island were largely seeking liberty. They were seeking hope and freedom. In the Christian word, they were seeking salvation. My grandmother, after World War II, decimated her hometown. Was, you know, the whole city was rubble. Got on a boat, came across, landed in Canada. People came here looking for a new life, looking for salvation. 
And so because of this, in America, there's all kinds of people. And because there's all kinds of people here, we have all kinds of churches. There is churches that uh, are in Korean and Chinese. There's churches that are bilingual. There's suburban churches. There's small little rural churches with seven people, right? There, there's all kinds of churches. We heard about a church outside of Atlanta, Georgia, that has the most diverse pocket. There's all kinds of people in our country. And in Camas, here, we have a Camas address. This has affected us greatly, because the way that this church started in 1982 was a very different campus than it is today. See, see this town was founded um, before it was even a town. It founded because a lumber mill was put here. We're called Mill Town. I brought a picture. So what campus used to look like, mud roads, different places. The Lacamas Colony Company in 1883 needed a site for their mill that had plenty of water and timber. So they picked right down there, two miles down the road, and for a hundred years, this was basically a town of a couple thousand people because the mill was here. Fast forward to 1983. Uh, a mayor was elected, a woman named Nan Hendrickson, still alive, still active in our community. Nan became mayor in 1983, and she was voted by the Chamber of Commerce Citizen of the Century. She still is, if you've, if you've met Nan. She's an incredible woman. She helped put in infrastructure and policies that would pave the way for what Camas and Washougal and East Vancouver, what would start to blossom in these areas. And the year before this, Dave McKay moved to town. And thousands of people came out here to meet Dave and to look for jobs, right? But I want you to, the population of Camas did this starting in the 1980s. It's like sevenfold. And with the jobs came the people. And Camas went from a small town of almost all, you can imagine what this church was like in 1984. I don't know if you can picture mill town, 6,000 people. As the population went up, so did the church. And Camas became considered a nice place to live, a nice suburb. We put in docks and um, I brought a picture, pretty picture of Camas. I went for a walk here the other day. Ah, people started buying houses. But a few things have shifted since the 1990s. The internet, Right? Wafer Tech came in 2015. Fisher Investment put its headquarters here. In two years, HP Hewlett Packard wants to put design and research headquarters about two miles that way. And with all of this happening, tens of thousands of people have flooded in. Just look at the population of Vancouver. This is all going somewhere, by the way. 40,000 people back when this church was planted. And now East County. East County, what used to be pockets of people, Washougal, Camas, Fern Prairie, Hawkinson, Vancouver, Gresham, that was divided by farmland and rivers, has seen tens of thousands of people flood in. And just this week, how many of you saw this, uh, this post in Money Magazine? It looked like, looks like this. Anybody see this by Money? Money Magazine put Camas right in there, uh, you know, <laughs> to millions of readers, Camas, Washington, top 50 places to live, right? My point being, to quote one of our staff, and many people just in the room right now, one of our staff said this this week, no! <laughs> Quote's not done. Shut your mouth, Money Magazine. <laughs> Everyone in the country is going to move here, okay? And I want to say, it's not going to stop. And it's not just that everybody in the country is going to move here. People from around the world have already begun to move here. My neighborhood, I was walking around yesterday, my kids' school, this church, every week I talk to people who uh, grew up or their parents grew up in China, in Taiwan, in the Ukraine. Uh, they're from a mixed race family. They're grew, they've been here five generations. They are cowboys with big trucks. Portland and California transplants. Hey, good, nice to sit next to you today. Yeah. People from Seattle pretending like they grew up here. Suburbanites, political <laughs> zealots. <laughs> political zealots and people who are so disenfranchised with politics they can't stomach the conversations. Everybody is starting to move to East County, it feels like. And that farmland that used to divide the towns has turned into one continuous neighborhood. 
it starts rural, and then it goes to Green Acres with those giant five-acre lots with beautiful homes, and then very affluent communities, suburban and into urban. And I don't know where one city stops and one starts. I don't know the difference between Washougal and Portland anymore besides the big trucks and the flags that hang everywhere. But in this continuous city, Jesus said, Jesus said that we were to go make disciples of all the nations. But Grace Church, the nations have moved to our doorstep. And my question is, are we ready for them? Are we ready? Are we ready to love our neighbor as ourself? Are we ready to share the gospel with them? Are we ready to invite them to sit next to us at an empty seat in church? Are we ready to open our homes to them? Are we ready to cook them meals? Are we ready to teach them how to pray and how to read the Bible, how to become a disciple? Are we ready to invite them with us as we go feed the homeless, as we take care of the broken? Are we ready to let them lead when they become strong in their faith? Are our hearts in a place where we're able to make disciples of all nations who, by the way, are moving in all around us. Is your heart ready? At Grace, there's, there's all kinds of people here. And, and some of us, we, we hear a sermon or we hear songs about this being a multicultural, multi-ethnic place. And we go, yes, finally, my moment has come, right? Camus is shifting. What this church was in 1982, it, it, this church does a good job of reflecting the community. And that is rapidly shifting what this looks like. But some of us, we don't really know what to do with it. And, and we have the question, where do I start? Where do I start? And that's the last little line here. So I had a story I wanted to finish with, and then we'll, we'll close with a song. But with where do I start, um, there was a story that I felt like gave a good picture of this. And I've mentioned this a lot of times. I, a very significant part of my life is I got to go live in South Africa. And in South Africa, there is uh, nine major local tribes of, of Africans, and one of them is the Kosa people, and the Kosas are famous because that's Desmond Tutu, that's Nelson Mandela, and they're also famous for their language because they have what's called clicks. The clicks is like, there's I think five distinct clicks that are woven throughout the language, and it's almost impossible to speak unless you really try and you focus it and you learn it um, for someone like me. So when we were down there, I bumped into a gentleman who was uh, a Kosa gentleman. And we were striking up a conversation. I said, oh, you're Kosa, Desmond Tutu. You know, like trying to relate like an awkward Westerner coming through. And he's like, yes, all right. He's like, but it's not Kosa. It's, I can't even do it. Kosa, but Kosa. And he said it with a click. And I was like, oh, Kosa? He's like, no, no. <laughs> he goes, it's Kosa. I was like, okay, Kosa. N- no, right? <laughs> so, Kosa, Kosa, right? We go back and forth. And eventually he goes, good try. <laughs> and just like that. And I was like, Yes, like, <laughs> I tried. Uh, but, but the rest of the, I mean, the rest of the time with him, we shared a meal, we laughed, we talked, and you could tell that me trying, me trying to go across and learn the language, me willing to humiliate myself and miserably fail at singing the Umbata way, Tutu. But I mean, like, I was so bad at that song. But to try, if you don't know what else to do, my ask is that our church, we try, try, try the food. Try to play the games. Ask questions. Sing the songs. Learn about other people. And you say, what if I offend people? You probably will, okay? But if you do it with an air of humility and a sincere heart to try to connect and learn from the people around you, you can honor them. And I don't want to be a church that doesn't do things like Mission Sunday because we're scared to try, and sincerely, if I've said something in the last half an hour that was offensive, I, I do not mean to. I try hard to be myself and say the things that I would normally say on stage. And I also don't want to be an idiot and offend people. But I do want to try. So that's what I would ask of you guys, is that we be a church that when we see people who is different from us, whether, whether it's moral or immoral or just cultural, that we try so that we could become a church that values the nations as much as our Heavenly Father does. Let's pray. 
Father, I thank you for your love for the nations, every tribe, tongue, and language. I thank you that we have freedom of speech here, the freedom to come together. I thank you for the poem, the new Colossus, that, that mirrors so much your words from Isaiah. Just give me your tired, give me your poor, give me your homeless. And I pray that we would be a church that honors this history and this culture of the Bible that says you are to love the foreigner as yourself. You were to love even your enemies as yourself and that you would grow in us, God, that your Holy Spirit would work in us, that we would be a people to love and to try to engage with one another and that as our community changes, we see it as an opportunity to share the gospel so that when we get to heaven, we have more friends to sing with. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, are you guys willing to try to sing one more time? You guys up for it? I would ask that we stand up and we try extra hard to finish out. And then we've got tables and food in the lobby that are going to be amazing. Thanks, Josh.